This is Think Tech Hawaii. Community matters here. Aloha. <clears throat> My name is Roger Jelinek. I'm the host of Book Worlds, and uh, I'm pleased to have Lee Siegel uh, here, who is a distinguished a professor of religion and also a writer and a sometime painter. Lee, welcome to the show. Oh, thank um, you. Tell us a bit about yourself, where you, you uh, grew up in quite exotic circumstances in Hollywood, I think. Uh, I grew up in Los Angeles in, in yeah. Beverly Hills and in, yeah. in the home where my mother still lives. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, my parents were in the film industry. There and, uh, but, I, but I've left that all behind me. All right. yeah. how, did, how did you get into academe? You know, um, you're a professor, okay. recently retired professor yeah. at UH. Yeah. 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 Well, I, um, frankly, I wanted to have a student deferment so that I didn't have to, it was either go to Berkeley uh, or go to Vietnam. That seemed to be an easy, easy choice. Yeah. And then while I was at Berkeley, um, Richard Nixon was running for a, a governor of California and he wanted to lower taxes and he said people, to lower, his argument for lowering taxes, um, lowering funds to uh, the University of California, he said people at Berkeley are studying things like Sanskrit. So I didn't know what Sanskrit was but I thought I'm going to take it. If Richard Nixon doesn't <laughs> like it, it must be good. Yeah. You know. So you took Sanskrit at Berkeley? Yeah. And then I was interested in India um, and went on, did research in India and, and did a doctorate in Sanskrit and Indian studies. Yeah. But you did a doctorate at Oxford or? In, in Oxford. In Oxford, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah that was fun. And, yeah. uh, <laughs> uh, but you were also a writer and an artist. How did that work? Um, <clears throat> well, I, I had aspirations, I, in one way I had aspirations to bring the two together. William Blake was a, you know, a sort of inspiration there. But the thing about uh, painting that was so hard is you, you do a drawing or a painting and you can see it and you see how terrible it is. Whereas you write something and you can imagine that it's good because it's in the drawer or between, you know, or in a folder. So I, I found um, um, painting, you know, too awful to, <laughs> to bear, whereas writing I could fool myself, you know. Well, but you've done a lot. You know, you've yeah. got a number of academic books yeah. and a number of literary yeah. books. Yeah. You know. uh, tell us about the, the novels. They seem to have a pretty uh, um, uh, a theme that seems to run all the way through the, yeah. the subject of yeah. love. Yeah. Uh, why? <clears throat> well, okay. You know, I um, I had been writing academic. Well, I wouldn't say academic books, scholarly books. Were, in other words, books that were true. Mm -hmm. um, and my field was India, um, so writing books about that. And I was very lucky because the University of Chicago Press became my publisher, so I had a kind of foot in the door, you know? Mm -hmm. So I then decided just for fun, uh, my, my scholarly books were becoming more and more like novels, you know, trying to write them without footnotes and trying to write them as a narrative. And I decided to try to flip that on its head and write a a, a fictitious book, a novel that looked like a scholarly book that had footnotes in a bibliography, even though I made up all the books in the bibliography. And that was the book, uh, Love in a Dead Language, about India and drawing on my um, studies or knowledge of India. And it just took off. I, I was very uh, lucky, you know. It, it that was took a, off. A, a breakthrough book for you, and you, know, you got a front page review in the New York Times. Yeah, I was, I was very um, lucky. And you've, uh, I've seen really lengthy interviews with you comparing you to Nabokov and um, uh, yeah. other writers who are very playful. <laughs> yeah, well, um, this is a Philip big Roth. moment. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. I think the thing is, it's interesting, and of course this is not uncommon, that you have an author that has a, uh, a first book that does yeah. very well, and then after it's difficult. And I would say, when that book came out, suddenly agents were calling me and publishers wanting to give me money. <laughs> and it was so thrilling and exciting. But then, the next book uh, sold about half the number of copies that Love in a Dead Language sold. And the one after that, about half of that, half of that, half of that. So I'm down to just a few copies of a uh, book now. Well, let's, let's, let's talk about how, how that happens. <clears throat> you know. Um, 
uh, one of the banes of, uh, of, of publishing is you have this uh, algorithm that's called BookScan, which reports pretty precisely how many books are sold, where they're sold, yeah, sure. who they're sold to. Yeah. And uh, a problem They're that, telling people, my mother has been buying all my, <laughs> all my it, books, yes. she's on there. The problem that often <laughs> happens is you have a successful book and follow up, up by yeah. a book that's perhaps not as sensational. It doesn't do quite as well, yeah. and, that, and this is perceived as a trend. Yeah, right. And then it yeah. just reinforces yeah. itself. Sure. You know. Sure. Um, so you went back to the University of Chicago. Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, the marketing person on my last book said, "Well, Lee, how do you expect to sell sell books? You don't have any Facebook friends or any Twitter accounts or anything like that," which is true. But telling me I don't have any friends made me kind of sad. <laughs> <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, it's a, a tough business, and I think where it's going, um, no one really knows. Mm -hmm. You know, I I try to. I've been thinking about since you asked me to join you today, yeah. the sort of history of writing, and my, the history of my writing. You know, placed within it, and if I think that, you know, in the beginning there's no writing. People were still telling stories and they had ideas and they had characters and people in those stories were having sex and killing each other and everything, you know, nothing's changed in that way. And that writing just um, came to make a record of things, how many um, bags of oats I sold you, but also to make a record of some of these stories. So our very earliest writings are really um, a sort of uh, putting down of what was really oral. Yeah. Um, oral literature in India, where you know what I know about the, the the spoken word, the recited word, the sung word, is infinitely more valuable or or valued than than any written word. You know, um, but at any do, do they regard writing it down as a kind of cheating? Uh, it is kind of well. It's for the teacher <laughs> to have the notes to look down, as he can tell, or for the the reciter to have a kind of record so that when he's reciting the poem, he can look up. But people really want to hear it. And when, when that's the case, you get a kind of uh, uh, sound of words rather than the look of words that we get with, with writing. You know? that's, that's really interesting because uh, I run a book and music festival. Yeah, sure. And uh, I'm part of a movement that's global, that mm -hmm. these festivals mm -hmm. are proliferating everywhere. So you ask yourself, how come? Because the books, as a as a medium is not yeah. flourishing, yeah. Uh, and it's because people want to hear the words from the of authors. Course. They want to hear the stories yeah. direct, yeah. and I think that they value that more than they value the page. I, I yeah. think so. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting to me because you know after Gutenberg invents this amazing thing, the printing press, were people going, "Oh, what a drag! What they're going to be all these out of work bards? You know, what are they going to do for a living?" Um, and in fact, though, is that turning around with the end of, I think, the end of writing, um, where we've got, if you go on Amazon, so many books you can get by the audio book and yeah. listen to it in your car. Are we, were in a way, returning to the bard? Uh, yeah, you know, that's, uh, I, I wonder, you know, I wonder. Um, you know, I see, when I, I, I'm interested in the history of writing. And I, and I don't mean writing the intellectual history, I mean the physical history. I have here a, a quill, a feather, and when you think the association of a word, you know, with a bird, with flight, with a flock, and this had to be carved. You had to keep carving it and then toss it and use another one. And it was very intriguing, Flaubert, wrote a, a letter to George Sand after the metal nib was invented. And he said that metal nib is going to destroy writing because people will be able to write a whole sentence without stopping. They won't have to stop to carve the quill. And when they stop to carve the quill, they're going to think of the, just the right word, mm -hmm. the, the mot juste. So, you know, the quill went, by the way, to the dip pen where you could write more. And that went to the pen that you could fill, you know, that you had an eyedropper and you, you filled it and then you could write really a lot. Um, and where did that go? It went right here. And now this, my new thing is, um, is uh, 
the experience of writing as typing, and this is where my history with writing comes. I remember I had a sort of contraband um, copy of Playboy magazine, and they were interviewing Jack Kerouac, and they asked him, how does someone become a writer? And he said, they, le they have to learn to type. And you know, in my youth, I'm like 15 years old, aspiring, every writer, author, type. You know, the picture of the author could be at his typewriter with a bottle of bourbon, that's not, that's just a flask of bourbon, an ashtray, very important in a drink, that, that that's what it meant to be a writer. So I learned to smoke and drink and type um, in order to, to try to write things. And um, I haven't heard that sound in a long time. And isn't it a beautiful sound? And, and if I go far enough, we can hear that bell. And I do it fast like this to hear it. Ah! Ah! There, that's it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. The, the sort of music of typing as opposed to this. And then having a physical object here, having putting this physical piece of paper with a, with my carbon paper, making a, a copy of it, is so much different than having something on a you know on a computer. But don't you find word processing is also liberating? The fact that you can compose and edit. Um, yeah, the, I'm hooked on word processing. You know, you know, I wish I could lie and say. Word processing, what's that? You know, I wish I could. Um, the last book that I've written that's yet to be published, I typed um, uh, completely as a way to try to return. I, you know, I remember the exhilaration of, I, I took a typing class, and then the exhilaration of late at night typing, it made me feel like, a, oh, I'm really a writer. Well, we're, we're going to take a little break now, but we'll get back to that right, okay. right away. Great. Thank you. This is Think Tech Hawaii, raising public awareness. I just walked by and I said, what's happening, guys? They told me they were making music. I'm DeSoto Brown, the co-host of Human Humane Architecture, which is seen on Think Tech Hawaii every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. And with the show's host, Martin Despang, we discuss architecture here in the Hawaiian Islands and how it not only affects the way we live, but other aspects of our life, not only here in Hawaii, but internationally as well. So join us for Human Humane Architecture every other Tuesday at 4 p.m. on Think Tech Hawaii. <coughs> Lee, you were saying uh, how uh, the touch, the touch of the typewriter, was very important to you. You've just written a book, and you very kindly sent me a, a, a file of it. It's not been published yet, so I feel very privileged to have read it. I absolutely loved it. I'm not sure how to pronounce the title, but this is the this is the um, if you could focus on it. This is the cover, the projected cover. Yeah, Pertia is the. It's, it's the top row. The of the, top row of the, of the writers. Um, and, and it's a wonderful premise. you want to describe it? Well, the, the <clears throat> premise is that, like so many other people um, writing in the 21st century, I'm discouraged. And, you know, it's no longer, it's not a pleasure to sit and try to write a novel or something. And so the premise here is that I'm visiting my mother's home in Beverly Hills, where I grew up. And she's a big fan of mine, <laughs> and so has a, which is true, has a box of, uh, of my writing from college and high school and so on. And um, in it, I discover, rummaging this box, I discover something I, I wrote about myself when I was, as a 15-year-old, but I wrote it when I was a 20-year-old. And as I started to read it, it's, uh, in a way, it's somewhat puerile, I suppose, and sort of um, desperately dirty. I, I had um, 
been given a banned, completely banned copy of uh, Henry Miller's Tropic of Cancer, and I just changed my life. This is what I wanted to do. I wanted to write dirty words, you know. <laughs> and uh, uh, but you know, cool. And and I wanted to drink and smoke too. Um, so at any rate, as I read through it, I remembered this exhilaration of late at night sitting up and typing. And so I decided to go on eBay and get a typewriter, the same typewriter, that's this, a Royal uh, from 1950, the same typewriter that I had typed this story on to see if I could recapture that feeling of, ah, oh, I'm a writer, <laughs> you know? Um, <laughs> And so I'm, there are two parts to the book. The, the part that I wrote when I was uh, uh, an 18-year-old writing about a 15-year-old, and then the part that is a 72-year-old with the same old typewriter writing about that 18-year-old. And it, you know, it was interesting to me in, in reading this that what do I, what do I have in common um, with this person, this 15-year-old? What do I have in common with him? 60, almost 60 years later. Um, and, and, you know, so the, the, that sort of psychological dimension of it, understanding uh, my relationship to all the people that I've been, you know. Um, yeah. Well, but I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It's a very funny, it's a hilarious book. You oh, know. thanks. Uh, the, <laughs> the way you, you managed to... Uh, <laughs> Use typing as a way of making love was fascinating. Yeah. You know? Well, I'm from my my premise is that um, typing is to literature what sex is to love. You know that typing is well for me at that time was that that this is literature. This is not like um, you know writing a little note or something like yeah. that. No. Yeah, this is literature. And, and uh, I can never tell in your works whether you're, anything is true or not, which is the privilege of a li true. literary imagination. <laughs> <laughs> but were you actually ever in Paris at that time? Yeah. I mean, okay. Uh, okay. Uh, I would have to go through it with you and say true or not true. I, I, I suppose I could do that in, if it get, when it's published, just have a T or F in the, in the column, <laughs> or actually have the reader guess true, you know, like a true or false um, quiz. But it Someone, reads very true. Okay, no, well. At least what I want it to be true. A friend of mine who just read it, a, a French woman actually, a friend of mine who just read it, a French woman unbelievably named Fanny, that's true, um, who just read it, said, well, I read it, and I, but I also read your other book, the, who wrote the Book of Love. Now, you you can't have lost your virginity to two entirely different women. Uh, which one was it, you know? <laughs> I, I, I'm not a telling. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah. Well, I think it's, I, I think it has, this is, this, to me, seems like it's going to be a very successful book. Oh, that would that'd be fun. You know. Are you uh, writing anything else at the moment? No. I'm writing a query letters to publishers, <laughs> you know, and that that, um, that takes a more literary skill actually than maybe writing a, a fiction. Uh, yeah. But you find you have to write to an or be assured of an audience in order to write. Yeah, I, I can remember when I had a royal typewriter and I was 18 years old, how incredibly much fun it was to write, regardless of who read it. I could always count on my mom uh, and a couple of friends, but that, you know, it didn't matter. I, I, that's no longer the case for me. I, I want to be talking to someone, not talking to myself, you know. Yeah. Well, maybe you should have a, a, a reader's group <laughs> to, uh, to be assured of an audience to begin with. No, but I See, understand. that's hard. I, I have a dog who will listen, uh, you know. Actually, um, I, in, in getting this dog, I bought a book, How to Train Your Puppy, and I think the greatest first line, I may steal it in the next thing I write, better than Call Me Ishmael, better than it was the best of times and the worst of times or whatever. And the line is, Thank you and congratulations for buying my book. Woof, woof. 
<laughs> you think it worked for my next book? <laughs> yeah, I think so. When, when you write, are you aware of what other people are writing? Do you read a lot? Yeah. Um, hmm. I, I read um, something that will help me, that will inspire me, that will hmm. get my adrenaline going, something connected. So I think I've read everything that's been written about typewriting. Uh -huh. And actually, is, it, is there a large literature on it? Yeah, and there's this wonderful new movie, California Typewriter. I, w I think that, uh, and you know, Tom Hanks is in it. As he's a collector, he has hundreds of typewriters. Um, you know, um, I'm not a collector, but I have a beautiful 1919 Corona which came with, Mike didn't, but originally came with a tripod. And the idea was you go to the Amazon, you set up your, your typewriter and write. You're on the front line of battle, and you set up your typewriter mm -hmm. and write. That it became a, an, an instrument of, of creativity, but also of bravura and of courage mm -hmm. and of adventure. You know? I'd, like to, I'd like to get that feeling again. <laughs> uh, you don't think you can? I don't know. Yeah. Writing, you know, the writing's on the wall in a sense. I mean, is there only going to be audio books? You know, someone was just telling me, oh, Lee, you know, there's this program where you can just talk and it'll turn it into type. And then you can send it to somebody, and if they don't want to read it, they can turn it into voice, okay, <laughs> in any language they want, man or woman. And I thought, well, let's just get rid of the text and the paper. Let's just tell stories, not write them. If that's the case, things like books are a thing of the past, and things like this show yeah. are things of the future. You know, that but may, instead of me well talking be. to you, I'd be going once upon a time. But uh, <laughs> you know, everyone is con is uh, well, the convention is that e-books will take over. Yes. But actually, it's not the case. They've plateaued. Yeah. And and uh, the big stores have also plateaued, and independent bookstores are coming back. Uh, um, really. Yes, I hope really? so. Yeah. I'm, I'm sentimental and yeah. nostalgic. I love, I like books, yeah. you know, and, um, you know, but I'm, I'm not that optimistic as, as the technology. Um, a friend of mine who teaches high school here said that his students, they, they have computers to write their papers on. They prefer to write their papers on their iPhone. <clears throat> And yeah, I, I'm, I'm blown away. But there again, I, I don't want to be reactionary. I'm trying to uh, imagine that the, the stories will continue to be told. Beautiful characters will continue to be born. Whether they'll be uh, manifest and alive on paper, I don't know. Now you uh, to go full circle. You grew up in Hollywood. Yeah. So. Movies now take up a huge amount of time, people's time, yeah. storytelling through yeah. movies, particularly these long series on television. Yeah, right. How interesting. And, yeah. and uh, so we, you know, that may be a bigger threat to books than Yeah, than but I e think also yeah. the need of young people, they can be watching the movie, answering their email, looking on Facebook, shopping on Amazon all at once. You know, the stimulation... Um, that I think young people uh, can handle, you know, blows my mind. Yeah, you but know. time is a crucial element. How on earth do you find time? This is my technology. Is my flip phone? <laughs> you know, what is? I, I actually, young people have said to me, "What is that?" <laughs> no. yeah, I've got a typewriter, a flip phone, and a pen, <laughs> but I do have bourbon. You know. Oh, well, that's great. That's great. Well, I think uh, we have to wrap up now. But okay. Thank you very much, Lee. Well, no, thank and, you. It's and uh, I wish you all luck, not only with this book on typewriting, but the future as well. Thank you. Yeah. No, and it's been much. a pleasure for me to hang out with you. Aloha. <laughs>